Welcome to City of Hope. Kindly use our mother's room for your convenience. Bible School and Counseling School registrations are open. Please contact the church office for more information. All tweens from ages 10 to 12, you're invited to join City Youth every Friday night from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The Divorce Care Program commences on Tuesday, the 31st of January in the chapel. And Grief Share commences on Sunday, the 5th of Feb at 8 a.m. in the prayer room. Joining a cell group is the best way to grow at City of Hope. For more information, please contact the church office. Cell groups commence on Wednesday, the 1st of Feb at 6. Relentless Love in a Healing Retreat is from the 2nd of Feb to the 4th of Feb. Faith Track commences on the 12th of February at 11 a.m. in the chapel. Invite your teacher and let us celebrate our educators on Sunday the 19th of Feb with our Teacher's Appreciation Service. Also on the 19th of Feb, our Sunday Fun Day with the opening of our City Kids Play Park. Our TCN Provincial Conference is on the 24th of Feb at 150 rands per person. This conference aims to take pastors, leaders and teachers to the Summit of Leadership. Our early bird registrations before the 30th of January carries a discount. So contact the church office for more information. Sit back and enjoy the service. This morning I want to give you the grand master key of life. How many of you know that we live not in our own universe but in God's universe, right? And in His universe, it operates by His laws and his governing principles. One of the governing laws in, 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 on earth is gravity. How many of you are not thankful for the law of gravity? Because if it weren't for gravity, you wouldn't be able to walk, sit, or run, or drive your car. We'd all be floating in midair. And so God gives laws that govern life in his universe. And one of these laws is the key I'm going to give you today. What is a master key? Now I remember the the, 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 the man who looked after our school's facilities and even Uncle Les here at the church, he's got this bunch of keys. And every door has got a key and it's numbered and named. And, but then he's got master keys and a master key can, can open any, unlock any door within that range. And then what you find, you've got a grand master key and a grand master key can unlock nearly any door. And the key I'm going to give you today is a grand master key. It is the key that's going to teach us how to use the other keys. The key of honor, the key of joy, the key of thanksgiving, the key of humility. When to practice what key? And that's the grand master key. How many of you want the grand master key? Okay. Now, this is what Paul says in, in the same chapter we've been reading for the last three, three months. This is what he says in Philippians 2, second part of the verse. He says, now work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See, there's the key. For it's God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. The grand master key of life is the fear of the Lord. Come on, can you say that the grand master key of life is the fear of the Lord? Now, what is the fear of the Lord? Some of you, when we talk about the fear of the Lord, instantly think, I need to be afraid of God. But the fear of the Lord is not fearing God. It is something else. In, in the book of Exodus 20, verse 20, it says, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of Him may remain in you, so that you may not sin. It's interesting. It almost sounds like a contradiction. He says, Don't be afraid, so that you can fear God. Get that? The fear of God is not fearing God. It's something else. In Afrikaans, we say, Brothers, when die van die Heere, he? Dis nie die vrees vir die Heere nie, dis die vrees van die Heere. And I don't know how to exactly explain that part in English. There's not a phrase that I can use like that, maar dis nie die vrees vir God nie, dis die vrees van die Heere. So what is it? What is the fear? The, the, the Greek and Hebrew meaning of the fear of God, the, the word fear is reverential respect. Come on. Reverential respect. Okay, worshipful awe and intimate trust. There's a slide that we have on that. If you can put it up and just keep it up for a while. Reverential respect, worshipful awe and intimate trust. 
Now, some of us come out of traditional churches, like myself. We were born and baptized and christened, if you were not baptized, but christened in the Dutch Reformed Church. Now, how many of you come out of, you hail from a more traditional background? Dutch Reformed, Engekerk, um, Anglican Church, Presbyterian Church, like this one friend of mine, I was discipling him. I said, where? Why didn't you come to church? He says, no, I went with my girlfriend to her church. I said, what church? He said, the pedestrian church. I said, I said no, man. What? Pedestrian church? He said, yes, the pedestrian. I said, no, man. Wasn't it the Presbyterian? Yes, that one, the pedestrian. Okay? So if you've been in the pedestrian church or the Anglican or the Methodist or the Reformed or that forum, how, come on, how many of you come out of more traditional? Okay? How many of you grew up in, in the charismatic, sorry, in the charismatic churches or Pentecostal? Come on. Okay. Yes, see my yellow man. Okay. So what I've observed this, and, and, and help me if I'm wrong. Those of us who grew up more in traditional churches tend to have a very strong sense of the fear of God when it comes to reverential respect. Ons het een baie groot sin van die vrees van die Heere, en ons het een hoog achting en respect vir die Heere. You don't talk in church, you don't laugh in church, you don't put up your hands when you sing, you just be quiet. Want God is almachtig. Okay? God is almighty, okay? And that's a good thing, right? The downside of that is that those of us who grow up very traditional, and if you continue in that vein, you will have reverence for God, but you will lose out on intimate trust. You don't have that connection with God, that intimate relationship with Jesus, right? The others that grew up in the charismatic church or the charismatic church, which we are part of the charismatic flow, right? Grew up with the sense that Jesus is my closest friend, a brother that, or his friend that sticks closer than a brother. And God is my God, but he's also my daddy, my papa. And we've got this intimate connection, but the danger of that again is that we may fall in familiarity and disrespect to God. Where God becomes my buddy and my pal, and almost like a genie type of God, instead of having that reverential fear and awe for God. And I think the beauty of this church, City of Hope, or even, even having our demographic where we're different cultures and different backgrounds, is that we can learn from one another. Those who are strong in the part of intimate trust, but lack a little bit of the reverence and the awe and the respect, can learn that from those who come from traditional backgrounds. And those who come from traditional backgrounds, and you've got this reverence and awe for God, but when worship time comes, you don't know how to connect with God as, as in His intimate presence. You can look to those who are more free in that area. Maybe if they raise your, their hands, you can raise your hands just a little bit. Like that, okay? And then maybe next Sunday, just a little bit more. And we can learn from one another. We can grow together to have the fear of God in our midst. You see, reverence starts by grasping who God is. That He is altogether lovely. That He is altogether holy. That He is altogether wonderful. That He is greater and larger and grander than we can even begin to fathom. That He is exceedingly abundantly above our wildest imagination. If we grasp His wonder, a sense of awe and worship fills our heart. You see the angels cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know why I believe they cry that? The Bible says His presence is surrounded by angels. The Bible says that every second of every day, God reveals a new attribute of who He is, something greater, something grander, okay? For all eternity, it's going on. And when these angels look, they see a facet of God. And when they see that, the only uh, logical response is for them to fall down and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the next second, God reveals another facet of who He is. And again, the angels go, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. May the earth also be filled with this glory that we are seeing. And for all eternity, that will continue because there's no end to His wonder. There's no end to His splendor. There's no end to standing in awe of Him.
And friend, if you feel like you can't worship, you don't have something to worship. And I want to ask when last that you have a revelation of the goodness of God, of the love of your Father, of the greatness of our Master. King Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. He was also the richest man that ever lived up to recently. Do you know that King Solomon's wealth accumulated to something of one trillion US dollars? The richest man, the wealthiest man, the wisest man that ever lived, wrote this in Ecclesiastes 12. Solomon is saying, this is the bottom line of life. Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. The bottom line of life, the conclusion of it all, is how we have feared the Lord, how we have lived in the fear of God. That a sense of holy awe, that respect and reverence and intimate trust. The outcome of your life is going to be determined by how you have either feared the Lord or not feared the Lord. Because if you're not fearing God, another fear will drive your life. Most important matter is making God's main thing our main thing. In Proverbs 8, same Solomon writes, he says, the fear of God is to hate evil. Can you say the fear of God is to hate evil? It continues and says, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate. And John Bevere has been one of my mentors, He's a great teacher and author, and, and he wrote a book and a series on the fear of God. And this is his definition of the fear of God. He says, the fear of God is to love what God loves. Come on, this can be a motto to our life. God, I want to love what you love. The fear of God is to hate what he hates. Is to honor what he honor. And want what he wants. To make his main thing my main thing. I want to honor. I want to want what God wants. I want to desire what God desires. Now this brought me to, to what we call the, 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 the value hierarchy or the hierarchy of values. Can you put that slide? Just keep that slide up. I want you to form a mental picture of this, this hierarchy. Each one of us has got a hierarchy of values. Okay, right? Come on, turn to your neighbor and preach at him or and say, you've got a hierarchy of values. Now, I drew up this, and it's just a draft of some values. Né? And I put God on the top because religiously all of us want to say that God is at the top of our hierarchy. Is it right? I'm going to show you in a moment's time that for most of us, most of the time, God is not at the top of our hierarchy, if we're honest. And I pray that this morning a spirit of conviction will grip each one of our hearts. And something will shift in our priorities, in our value hierarchy. To honor what God honors, to, to value what God values. Okay, that's the fear of the Lord, right? So your values, your hierarchy of values, priorities can, you can say God is at the top, but we're going to test that now. Family, very important value. Unless we put our family above God, right? Spouse must be a value. Unless we replace that spouse over and above God, then it becomes an idol, right? Okay? My money, finances is, is important. The Bible says he doesn't work for his money, he will not eat. He cannot live in this world without money. Can't can't run a business, can't run a household, can't run a church without, we need finances. But what happens if all my energy, all my focus, all my desire, all my brain space goes into making money all my time, then I have placed money over and above God. Come on. We can do the same to our business, we can do the same to our careers. Some people make an idol of, 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 of their sports and their recreation. I mean, and it's great to gym, and it's great to do your sport, but sport can become an idol. I love my golf. I love my sport. But I remember when, when I got saved, hey man, I, I was a bodybuilder. You wouldn't say it today. Come on, I know what you're thinking. Okay. Truth be told is, is um, I was just at the point of starting to compete in bodybuilding competitions. And then, really, guys, you wouldn't say it, you know. And then I couldn't pay my gym fee, so they took my muscles. Okay. Now, that wasn't what it is. The Lord convicted me when I got saved. He said, son, you have made an idol of your own body. You've placed your body over and above worship of me. And I'm not saying everybody that gym must cancel their membership. I've got a home gym there in my house. I haven't used it this year yet. But 
be fit, jump, everything. Don't make it an idol. Don't be obsessed about it. Because we, we, we've got this human tendency to become obsessed with things, right? Social media. You know, I'm thinking, what is the thing that grabs my attention, that grabs my passion, my energy? If the first thing I have to do when I wake up in the morning is take that phone and go to Facebook or go to Twitter or go to my... and check what is out. I can't read the Bible before that. I'm, I'm, I'm edgy. I need to feed myself on that. It has become an idol, isn't it? It has become something above God. If I read Facebook more than I read the faith book of the Bible, I'm in trouble. And we can say that to any kind of addiction, right? Drinking, alcohol, or using drugs, or pornography, or smoking. You, you see, the downside of any addiction, it, it, it works in the frontal lobe of your brain where, where your pleasure center is. And so what happens is you, you do whatever you need to do to get that kick, you know, to get that fulfillment. But, but the way it works, and addiction works, next time you need to do that thing in excess to get that same kick. So in Afrikaans we say it's, it's the vet van afneembar of waarde. It's the law of, of reducing of value, reduction of value. So the next time I use that drug, I need to use a stronger drug to get the same kick, and a stronger drug to get the same kick, and that's how an addiction works. And how many of you know that all of that addictions comes with a lot of guilt and condemnation and shame? But I believe the fear of God, if I can put it in layman's term, the fear of God is to become addicted on Jesus. Because He's the only fix that can fix you. He's the only fix that won't leave you with guilt and shame and condemnation and, 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 and having a drop tomorrow, having bubble us in the organ. He's the only fix that can fix me and you. I don't know about you, but of late, I just have a new hunger for the Word of God. I've got a new hunger to spend time in my dad's Word and read it. And I've got a new hunger and thirst for His presence. And I want to become addicted on Jesus. You know, young people, they can get addicted on gaming, right? They can't live. They, they live from game to game. They come home from school and the first thing they do is Plony, Plony, stay station. Stony PlayStation, there we go, something like that. The Poloni PlayStation is on, right? It's the first thing they why. It's become an idol in my heart. And we need to help our young generation. And all the parents say, preach it, pastor, preach it. <laughs> and we are running from fix to fix. And none of them can fix us. And maybe your next, next fix is Netflix, I don't know. Twisting my tongue this morning, yeah. But God is saying, if you will make me your main thing, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the king of kings. And I will sort out the rest of the things. Put me at the top of your triangle. The, the, the end result of life, the conclusion. Solomon had everything the eye could wish for. He said, after all of this, having a thousand wives, Having all my pleasures taken care of. Having all the wealth a man can dream of. I conclude one thing. That the sole purpose of man is to fear God. And to obey Him. That's the main thing. Can I give you a quick 15 benefits of fearing God? Number one, Proverbs 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where wisdom starts. You know, why do we need God's wisdom? The Greek word for godly wisdom is Sophia, which means superior intelligence. How many of you know that if there's superior intelligence, there must also be inferior intelligence? At the tree of knowledge, Adam and Eve opted to live from inferior intelligence. We don't want to live from God's wisdom. We want to live from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As we self see it fit, we will decide. Albert Einstein once said, that no problem can be fixed by the same mindset that created it. Come on. Let me preach at this side of the congregation. No problem, David, can be fixed by the same mindset that originally created it, right? So if human wisdom caused the problem, how many of you know that human wisdom doesn't have the solution? If human wisdom caused Eskom to be in the Chamors, how many of you know that doesn't matter how much human wisdom you apply, it cannot fix Eskom? They need what wisdom? Heavenly wisdom. If inferior intelligence caused the problem in my life, a financial problem, 
I need superior intelligence, the wisdom of God, to fix it. If human wisdom caused my marriage to be broken, I need heavenly wisdom to fix it. If human wisdom caused me to be of ill health because I didn't live with regard to my body, I need heavenly wisdom to fix that. Any problem on earth is a wisdom problem. And this week, in our week of prayer and fasting, our wisdom week of prayer and fasting, we're going to come to God and say, God, you know best. Because that's really what the fear of God is. The fear of God is to acknowledge, God, I need your wisdom. I cannot live in human wisdom anymore. I need heaven's wisdom for my life. I need heaven's wisdom for 2023. So I'm going to humble myself and set time aside. And I'm going to acknowledge, God, you know best. You know best. We don't know best. You know best. Wow. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is to acknowledge God. In reverence I stand and say, God, you designed my life. You designed this universe. Teach me your ways. Show me your wisdom. In Isaiah 33, it says the fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. The fear of the Lord is the key, the grand master key to the treasure of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. The third benefit of the fear of God, Psalm 128, so shall a man who fears the Lord be blessed. How many of you want to be blessed? Fear the Lord. Number four, Psalm 34, those who fear him, there will be no lack of anything in their life. Come on. How many of you want, don't, don't want to lack anything in your life? Solution. Fear God. Number five. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring everything or forever. You know, I bet you, you're going to walk out of this building this morning feeling so clean and cleansed by the fear of the Lord because we're going to pray that God's going to pour out the spirit of the fear of the Lord this morning. It cleanses you. Have you ever stood in the presence of God, worshiping, just surrendering your life, just saying, Lord, forgive me for placing other things above you. I want to repent. I place you on the throne of my heart. How liberating is that? How cleansing is that? It just washes away the weight of the world. Number six, the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 10, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. I mean, how many want to live a short, short life? How many of you want to live a long life, a blessed life? That's the fear of the Lord. Number seven, the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 14. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. I mean, I need confidence. How many of you need confidence? I want to have confidence in, 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 in the way I live my life. Not only that, it says your children will find refuge. Your children will have security. I don't know about you. But if I look at the things going on in our country and ESCOM collapsing and all of these things, I'm, I'm thinking I need to find a way to get my kids outside of the country. I'm just honest as a dad. I'm not a pastor there. I'm a dad if I say that, right? Be funny a little, sir. Come on. How many of you honest? Let God be God and every man a liar. Okay, we thought that, right? Just, just get them to... It says here, if you fear God, your children's future will be secure. You fear God. He says, I will. You build my house. You fear me. I will look after your house, your children. Number nine, happy is the man who fears the Lord. You want to be happy? Fear the Lord. But he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. I pray today that no one will leave this building with a hardened heart. Come on, preach at your neighbor a little bit. Say, neighbor, don't walk out of here with a hardened heart. Good. Number 10 and 11, the fear of the Lord leads to life, bringing security and protection from harm. How many of you want to be protected? Wow, the fear of the Lord. Number 12, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. I remember how many times we are, should have been, would have been in a car accident and God protected me, supernaturally. You see, the fear of the Lord keeps us from the snares of death. Number 13 and 14. The reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. We've covered life, but riches and honor is another benefit. And then finally, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasures and turmoil with it. You see, the, the fear of the Lord brings some sense of contentment into my heart. And so how do we learn the fear of the Lord? How, how, how do we learn it? David in Psalm 34 says, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. We have to learn the fear of the Lord. It's not something that comes naturally. The fear of the Lord is like maths. How many of you that know that maths doesn't come naturally to you? Come on, you just didn't get born and you say, Yen mal, 
okay? It, it, it makes me think of, of, of this boy, Jimmy, that was on school with me. So the inspector, the circuit inspector came to our school and he wanted to test the children. So he asked Jimmy, he said, Jimmy, can you, can you recite your tables, your, your timetables? So we learned it in songs. I don't know if you also did it, like one times one is equal, you know, like that. So Jimmy d d did well on the one timetable, then he went to two, and he did all right, and then the three, he struggled. So he went, what? three times one is equal to three. Three times two is equal to six. Three times three is equal to nine. Now he couldn't work it out further. So he continues. Na, 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 So the inspector asked Jimmy, he said, Sudden, what went wrong? He said, Sir, I could remember the tune, but the words I forgot. Like maths, the fear of the Lord is learned. David says, come my children. You know what the children are doing this morning in children's church? They're doing a worshipful awe of God. They're doing reverence. They're doing the fear of the Lord. They, they're learning how to fear the Lord. It's something that we need to learn. Perhaps one of the most powerful and precious prayers in Scripture is found in Psalm 86, where David prays, Shock. He says, teach me your way, O oh God, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Some other translation says, teach me your ways, O oh God, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And this is a prayer we want to pray this morning. God, teach us your ways. Give us undivided hearts that we may fear your name. Why? Because a divided heart will disqualify you, not only from the fear of God, but from the wisdom of God, and from any other key of the kingdom of God. That's why the apostle James writes, and he says, if any one of you lacks wisdom, what should he do? He should ask, pray, and ask God. He will give you liberally, without finding fault, without prejudice. God says, I'm going to give wisdom to everyone. He says, but there's one condition you cannot doubt in your heart because a man who doubts is double-minded, double-hearted, and he's unstable in all his ways, and he can expect to receive nothing from the Lord. You see, if you and I are double-minded, double-hearted about what we ask, we're going to ask God for wisdom, but we're still going to rely on human wisdom. We're going to ask God for His superior intelligence, but at the same time, we're going to rely on human inferior intelligence. God, give me wisdom, but I'm going to run my finances the way I've always done it. Same problem, the same mindset that created the problem cannot fix it, right? God, help me with this wife, with this husband of mine, but I'm going to keep on treating her or him like I've always done. God, help me raise my children, but I'm going to treat them the same way that I've always done. Help me raise my, run my business, but I'm going to run it the same way. God says, no, 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 no. Give me an undivided heart. A heart that can fear your name. A heart that says, God, you know best. You know best. The beginning of the story, end of the story, you know best. I want to love what you love. I want to hate what you hate. I want to desire what you desire. I want to value what you value. I'm going to make your main thing my main thing. And then you and I, are going to become the beneficiaries of all of these 15 benefits. Secret key, the grand master key to a blessed life in God's universe. It's the fear of God. It's to stand in reverential respect for God. It's to stand in intimate trust. It's to stand in a holy awe and worship of God. It's to say, God, you know best. You know best, you know best, you know best. In my marriage, you know best. In my finances, you know best. With my children, you know best. In my work, you know best. In my business, you know best. Running your church, you know best. Changing our city, you know best. Fixing ESCOM, you know best. Fixing our broken country, you know best, God. You know best. It's not me, it's you. I don't know about you, but I'm so stirred up. I've been praying this prayer since the beginning of December. God, give me an undivided heart. That I may fear your name. Teach me your ways. 
that I may walk in your truth. Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom.